Our last speaker today is Dr. Daniel John Covinelli. He's going to present a talk called Desperately Seeking Explanation. Hmm. Which I can't. So I'm not able to explain it all. <laughs> So I thought it would be fun to end today's discussions by asking a playful question, which is, what might humanity look like if the human species finally does wrestle the human brain into submission? <laughs> now to put that question into context, though, I want to remind us how unique the human brain really is. I mean, it's the only brain we know of that's rolled out the wheel, that's invented books, harnessed electricity, built the internet. In less than 7,000 years, Balances, pyramids, pulleys, levers, lunar landers have all tumbled forth from the human mind. And in the less than the blink of an evolutionary eye, we've moved from leather slingshots to gravitational slingshots around other worlds. And along the way, we've even learned how the recipe for melting the polar ice caps and cleaving the atom. And look, it's, other species are intelligent too, it's just that their intelligences are focused on, on things that are directly observable to their various sensory systems. Things like seeds, bananas, who's grooming whom, uh, fish, sound waves, whatever's important to their particular natural ecologies. Uh, but you see, those intelligences don't get caught up in higher order accounts of what they're doing or why they're doing it. These are a great example. So they can communicate the direction, the distance, and the actual abundance of a patch of flowers to their fellow bees without any of them having any idea about distance, direction, abundance, let alone the fact that they're communicating with each other. But the human mind is different, right? It forms reasons, explanations, stories about why we behave the way we do, why the world behaves the way it does. And we all do it. I mean, we do it every day. That's just part of who we are. And look, it's not just that the human mind forms and seeks explanations, it seems to demand them of the world. <laughs> Gossip, folklore, religion, science, explanations seem to be the payoff for the higher order aspects of the human cognitive system. And so scientists like us can be seen as just kind of peculiar humans that are really focused on a specific kind of explanation, explanations that are reliable, ones that can be tested, ones that can be validated by showing that we have control of the systems we study, right? Uh, and that's what made science so powerful. It's also what's made it so dangerous. But look, that's not surprising, that's old news, right? It's just part of our story since the very beginning. We take the technical products of our explanatory activities, and then we try to harness them to yield maximum good and maximum harm. Cancer cures, plague scale biological weapons. Remote control toys, predator drones. Uh, we, <laughs> we seem to be focused on both the good and the bad. What? waves of information that are connecting us in all sorts of wondrous new ways, and the wireless implants that are soon coming that will be portals for propaganda and control that we're only slowly beginning to wake up to. But the good, playful news is that that's the way we can sort of think about what we're doing here today, right? We're just one group among thousands strewn across the planet that's trying to whip up some excitement for our particular efforts to wailed into submission, that last piece of the puzzle, that is to get explanatory control over the very organ that delivers the payoffs for those explanations in the first place. And look, we sort of know where it's heading, right? Science has a track record. We'll deliver increasingly precise images of, of the human mental operations and emotions, and at the same time, we'll deliver the technical means to increasingly monitor people's private thoughts and feelings. We'll deliver powerful new gene therapies to cure rare brain diseases as we pave the way for things like intellectually enhanced designer babies. We'll dramatically improve brain interface prosthetics that will allow the deaf to hear better and the wounded to walk better. At the same time, we accelerate the transhumanist's agenda for the more deliberate or intentional fusion of human and machine. And in the meantime, we'll yell at our children for circling their digital devices in ever tighter spirals, at the same time that we insist that they become more fused with those technologies that we throw at them. Look, we're reverse engineering the motivational system of the human mind and body, and then we're appalled that we're losing the power to avert our eyes and our attention, our index fingers. Okay, look, but humans, and scientists in particular, have 
a story to tell in their defense. And it goes something like this. It's, well, science isn't bad. It's what people do with science that's bad. Or, well, you know, uh, if I don't do it, someone else will. Or my personal favorite. Well, what are we supposed to do? Go back to the horse and buggy? But look, so maybe it's worth five minutes, I don't know, occasionally, to pause and reflect on whether the cliches really are well articulated to the predicament that the Human Explanatory Project puts us in. Whether the values we embrace in our scientific childhood are well suited to the power that the adult has to dramatically and increasingly influence and control our brains, our body, our behavior, our planet. And maybe even a couple of minutes for some of us to reflect on how we want to align ourselves with an enterprise that's steadily delivering futures that many of us wouldn't vote for, and how we might more align ourselves with futures that we would vote for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So let me uh, remind you that we have a discussion session from these excellent speakers. Before we stop, uh, I want to say a few things before uh, Pearson comes up. Number one, I want to first of all thank all of you for coming today. Number two, I want to thank the and the speakers. I thought they did a great job today. I want to thank Dr. Kalaru for supporting and funding this, uh, Ms. Jessica Manafi, uh, Ms. Madeline Spustik, uh, Ms. Dominique Rosaro, uh, Ms. Shelby Bosch, Peyton Broussard, Dr. Ryan Nelson, the Cecil P. Picard Center, and Dr. Burstein, and of course our uh, great moderator, Pearson Cross. And I'll turn it over to Pearson right now. Thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. This is the fourth one I've been associated with, and some of you have been here at all of them. They're always a mind-blowing experience. We always hear lots of different things that are wonderful. You've been given an assessment sheet. Uh, so at this time or before you leave today, we'd very much like to have you fill out that assessment. It's not because we want to hear how great our speakers are. It's because we're actually interested in kind of determining to what extent we're successful in our goals. And our goals are, of course, to promote research across particular communities of interest on various topics. And you could also suggest to us perhaps some future communities of interest. Uh, we're looking forward to doing this kind of a meeting in the future on different topics. We think they've been successful so far. We want to make them even more successful. So please take a moment to fill out that assessment and leave it with us, and we very much appreciate it. Now if we could have one last round of applause for the presenters, and then go out and talk to them.